Hi, everybody. Today on In Her Words, we get to talk to our dear friend, Suzanne Todd. Suzanne was at our very first summit and has been a friend of women in entertainment ever since. She has a great new project for the holidays, The Naughty Nine, coming out on Disney. We took a trip down memory lane and were able to talk about her new project. We think you'll enjoy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's been way too long, way too long. So you have been a, a busy, busy bee these last few months with your new project coming out? Yeah, I'm so excited. It's one of those ones, you know, because we actually shot it some time ago, because obviously we're only going to release it at Christmas time. Yeah. And so I was fondly remembering our time in very cold Montreal, which was almost two years ago now. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, we were there uh, December, January, February, oh. March. Yeah, almost two years ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and we all got our time kind of time sense back after COVID a little bit. And now with the strikes, I feel like we're all back in these surreal times of when things were filmed and when they were finished and how, the gaps and we're going to now take, you know, take forever to get going to back on track again from, uh, it has been. Yeah, we actually, we had a little COVID re shutdown on Naughty Nine, because even though lots oh. of the world was open um, in Quebec, they had decided that December to do mm. two weeks of a full shutdown, mm. like curfew, no one out after six o'clock. And so we had had to shut down prep for that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's, I do, I do kind of remember that now of some cities in December and the high flu season kind of taking that, that break and yeah, in 99, we still had the very, very strict COVID protocols. So the actors okay. would wear a face shield um, for rehearsal or any time they were oh, within gosh. six feet of each other. And then when we were ready to roll, many people would step in, take the face shields off, the kids would do their scene, and then they would step right back in and cover them up. Oh, wow. Very heavy COVID protocols, yeah. Right. And everyone stayed safe, I take it? Yeah, we had a... We, yeah. we never had a production shutdown. We had yeah. um, obviously like some infection because I think you can't get away from it. But we were on that cycle where we were text, uh, testing everyone, you know, three times a week uh, oh, right, on a rolling right. basis. So yeah, right. Monday, Wednesday, yeah. Friday, you would go do your COVID test before work. Testing. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, there's, I think there is definitely a, I hate the term, but there's a new normal in there somewhere. Yeah, it was a little more relaxed on the next movie that I did that we shot in Atlanta this past year. We were still COVID mm. testing, but it wasn't quite as extreme. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things for our for our followers and our subscribers that we are that we're really um, kind of digging into with our podcast is your history and your background of what there's there's some themes that are coming which i think we knew would come but it's so interesting to hear everyone's story the two things are when when we ask about you know everyone's path and everyone's history it's there couldn't be a more crooked path to uh for for all of us to get where we are today so i would love for you to kind of tell your story of you know have you always been creative? Did you grow up in a house where people were making movies or painting or, you know, doing doing creative things? Did you did you always know that you wanted to be a filmmaker? And and especially your story because you have the you have a really the business side of things and the creative side, which we don't see uh, we don't see those blend um, all that often. So I'd love to uh, I'd love for you to kind of share your your path and and what you uh, what little Suzanne thought she was going to be and where she turned out. <laughs> uh, I will tell you, I, unlike a lot of people that produce films and television. I actually wanted to do that from the time I was very young. I feel like you talk to a lot of people that are in producing and they came to it through another avenue. You know, for me, my parents were not in the business. I had a grandmother on my mother's side who was an actress back in mm -hmm. the days of like MGM contract players. Oh so she had been recruited very young by Louis B. Mayer for singing and dancing. And as a youngster, I would watch you know, reruns of those classic musicals. And she would always have a very tiny, small part in the chorus or, you know, one line singing in Easter parade and singing in the rain and all the classics. So it really started for me very young with musicals. And we would go, I grew up here in Southern California, but we right. would go to New York every spring break to visit my great grandmother who lived there and see all the Broadway shows. And I was just, taken in by all of it. You know, I think very young, that idea of participating in the storytelling 
that mm-hmm. felt so powerful to me was very interesting. So my parents weren't in the business, but I had a friend that I grew up with whose dad was a producer. And so okay. I had the benefit of understanding at a pretty young age what he did. His name was John Foreman and I had gone to you know junior high and high school. And then his daughter was also my college roommate at USC. And he had produced Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid oh and the Great gosh. Train Robbery and so many amazing movies. And actually let me go and work, you know, as a production assistant on um, when he was making the movie Pritzi's Honor, which is a really, really yeah. great movie and was a, was a fascinating project. So, like I said, by the time I got to USC in film school, you know, in the 80s, most of the people there, there weren't very many women. It was mostly men. And most of them came to film school wanting to be... George Lucas, wanting to be Steven Spielberg. You know, I want to be a director, but most of them showed up at film school not really even knowing what a director did. You know, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I grew up working here, I had had jobs, you know, terrible jobs, jobs where I took out the trash and jobs where I delivered scripts. And, you know, the summer that I was 17, I worked as a tour guide at Universal Studios, which is a very humbling and unique experience. talking to tourists about the back lot. I, frankly, I think I still have that two hour speech in my right. mind. I don't think you I would ever, it. <laughs> you know, I could probably give it to you right now, but it was really fun as a young person because it was kind of an access to what felt like the magic and the behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had had lots of other jobs in the space. So I felt like by the time I got to film school, I had a slightly different perspective on it, but I was also very popular because there weren't very many people focused on producing so at USC, the last film that you make before you graduate is meant to be a calling card for directors. They call it a 480. And when mm-hmm. it was my semester to do 480, all the directors were wooing me because the idea of having somebody who would focus on, you know, doing the proper schedule and feeding the crew and doing everything, you know, that a producer oversees um, was very attractive. It's funny when I think back on it because the director that I chose from the group, because I did have my pick, was Jay Roach, who then 10 oh years ago, gosh, of course. I had hired him to direct his first movie, you know, with uh, with Austin Powers. So uh, yeah, those things all go together. So then after film school, you know, I got out and started working. I had worked originally for another producer for some time on a bunch of movies and a few television shows. And then, you know, I kind of worked my way up. I was his associate producer and then co-producer and it got to the point where I really felt like I wanted to be doing it on my own. And so then I left, which was a huge kind of leap of faith. You know, you never know if you're going to end up having to work in McDonald's to pay the bills, but that worked out. And it it was really interesting because the first movie that I did out on my own, I got the job because the woman who at the time was running New Line Cinema, she was the head of physical production at New Line Cinema, she was somebody who I had worked for when I was 16. And oh the job when I was 16 was literally, like I said, like Xeroxing scripts, taking out the trash, delivering things. But she had tracked my career through the years. And she said, I always remembered how hardworking you were and how good you were at figuring things out. And basically, like, she believed that I was going places. And that was a key moment for me that she was willing to give me that next opportunity to really produce, uh, you know, a movie on my own. That's amazing. And, and I, I, when you said Jay's name, I smiled because I, we got to, I got to meet Jay a few times because we did, um, when I was at Arclight, we did so much with AFI and he was so involved with, um, with AFI and everything and being a part of the school. And he was, he was always just so lovely. Yeah. Just, just so great to uh, just so great to work with how um, navigating now, like you said, there weren't many women in USC film program at all. And then especially in production, did you, did you seek out other women as far as mentors and then mentees or did you, did you always feel comfortable, um, you know, having a blend of men and women, you know, helping you and then you, and helping others? How, how was that situation for you? I mean, I didn't really have a lot of male mentors. I did very unfortunately have one professor. I took a directing class as part of the curriculum. And I remember that that directing instructor had asked me in the first class, I was the only girl in the class, what I wanted to do. 
And I said, I thought I was interested in producing. And he had said, well, you know, there's really good careers for women in production if you want to be a script supervisor or maybe a costumer. And I said, I wasn't really interested in either of those two jobs, but I appreciated his input. But it was, it was interesting that it was that moment in time where mm -hmm. I think it was just starting to be a breakthrough for women in other kinds of jobs when historically, you know, in the time before me, and this is decades ago now, um, where there were certain jobs that it felt like women were probably, you know, pushed, if not railroaded into. So, um, you know, women that I met as a young person in Hollywood, uh, my, my office on the lot at Warner Brothers was just, you know, a few doors down from Dick Donner's office. Mm -hmm. And I had worked again as like an assistant or associate producer on Lethal Weapon 2 that Dick Donner was directing. And so I had the opportunity to meet and get to know his lovely wife, Lauren Schuler Donner. Mm -hmm. And I remember from the first time I met her, you know, and again, I was basically, you know, like coming up as an assistant, she was always so kind and warm and asked about me and was willing to answer any question. And, you know, the funny thing is Lauren and I have become friends over the years. She plays in one of my, you know, game groups. So I get to see her very regularly. Many, many years later, she did a huge, huge personal favor to me, getting a friend of mine into a key, uh, cancer study that she needed to be in. And, you know, she really has just, she's been one of those women who was always, always there for me. I can remember other women, you know, again, especially when I was very young and starting out, I remember having lunch with Sherry Lansing for the first time. And oh I God. felt like, I wished like I had my, I wished I'd had a notepad at the lunch mm -hmm. because everything she said, now it would be an Instagram snapshot. You know, there were right. so many things she said that were just so wise and so knowing and, I really appreciated when I came across those women and I was able to make those connections because there were far fewer than, than there are now. Seems like the successful, like comfortable in their own, own skin women are always, you know, they're always more generous and they're always willing to help and willing to share because they're, yeah, they're, there's just a special, that special breed that keeps rising to the top. Yeah, definitely. That sign of being in a good place, uh, in your own career and frankly, in your own ego that you're willing to, you know, put a hand out and help someone else. But frankly, right. I mean, that's, you know, so much of what it's about. You know, I've had a mentee through the Peter Stark program at USC mm -hmm. for more years than I can even count. And I always have a female mentee. And frankly, I've had some that want to be producers and some that want to direct and some that want to write and kind of all over the board. And it's so um, I feel so grateful and it's so satisfying to me to be able to share in any way. You know, I always say to them, I don't know that I'll be able to find you your dream job. I don't know that I'll have the answers to every question, but I'm here. And if you can benefit from the mistakes or successes that I've had, I'm really happy to share. Well, and just your longevity. I mean, the in especially this, you know, this last group or last probably 10 years, it feels like the the names and the people that that are successful and have long careers i mean you're you're in the upper echelon of 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 those names it's very it's it should they should be so honored that you're there to help them and i'm sure you're you're like you said your failures and your successes can uh, can teach them so much because there's just you know there's there's so many flash in the pan i think that that we see in you know and i think we're going to see more of that that the the long successful careers are are going to be the that's who they're going to seek out to get you know to get to get advice and information from yeah um, well, you know I, I go down and i guess teach for my friend ann globe teaches a class at oh, usc film school yes, on marketing yes. and production and i go down every year and guest teach in her class, which I did not that long ago. And now I'm in the crazy position where, you know, one of my own kids, my middle one is a senior now at USC oh my gosh. In school. So I have that thing when I'm going down to campus to speak or to be in a class where I always say like, well, where will you be? Or can you come by and say hi? And I'm so excited. You know, his, his journey has been very different than mine. And it's funny because, you know, when I was in film school at USC, we had just moved into a new facility that we call the new buildings, which of course, you know, these many years later have been torn down. Right, and right. New, new buildings. <laughs> it's so fancy. You know, it looks like you've driven on the lot at Paramount. It's gorgeous. Right. I mean, it was nice when I was there, but it is 
crazy. I mean, the technical things that are available, you know, to these kids, the equipment, the lighting, the mm-hmm. sound, the, you know, the scoring stages, all of it. It's really, yeah, it's a, it's an incredible kind of a hotbed of creativity and inspiration. So I love going down there. That's awesome. No, we do know Ian. She's, she's awesome. What, what does your son want to do? What area does he want to be in? He's been focusing a lot on cinematography and probably directing. He had done an internship years ago for the incredible, you know, number one music video director, Dave Myers. And he came out of that really inspired in that space. So he's had a little production company he's been running and they do a lot of music videos, um, mostly in the rap space, but in Uh some other places as well. And yeah, he, uh, he likes to shoot, but you know, it's so different now when I was going to film school, you know, not everyone had a, the ability to make a movie on their phone. You know, my right. son, my middle son, Dash, not only was already shooting movies and editing movies, he was, you know, scoring them with music he wrote. He taught himself to make special effects, you know, to make visual effects on his computer long before his first class and doing it um, at USC. So it's just a very different time in terms of what's available for visual storytelling. Right. You know, most of us, when we showed up at USC, had never shot anything you know we didn't have video cameras on our phones right yeah yeah the uh, yeah you were super eating it uh at home or something with your parents video camera all those stories but then the technology is it really does allow the it allows everything to you know the kids to come in with more experience and more but i think it also helps them they they also know what they want and what they don't want and they've you know been able to try different things i think that's really exciting really interesting and I'm also amazed at the different women that we've talked to that are you know, directing now and producing now um, that started in music videos. I mean, it really is a, uh, uh, a neat stepping stone or both ways where, you know, more film and television have, have dabbled in music videos and, and vice versa. I love that it, um, yeah, that seems to go back and forth a lot. Yeah, I went the other night, you know, um, LACMA has a fundraiser every year and they mm-hmm. honor uh, an artist and a filmmaker. And this year they were honoring David Fincher. And I was mm-hmm. so happy because it was so entertaining that before we got to see the wildly impressive David Fincher, David Fincher film reel, they cut a reel of all the videos because you realize, you know, David Fincher, before yes. he was David Fincher, literally did like the iconic George Michaels, like Madonna's Vogue, like you name it. Like the video reel is so impressive you watch it and you realize, well, of course that was David Fincher before he was the other version of David Fincher. That's amazing. No, I did. I forgot. I mean, I knew that he had done those. I remember what the, the George Michael, but yeah, that had to be really cool to see. I went, I bet I could find it on YouTube. Yeah. So fun. So the projects that, I mean, you've already named some that, you know, with lethal weapons and we know and the mementos and the big, huge movies, uh, the bad mom series that, that you've done, how, how are you looking at projects differently from a kind of where where they'll end up standpoint? Do you when you're when you're entertaining, you know, getting into a project or or starting a project, do you do you look at if it's going to be on um, network or if it's going to be on a stream or if it's going to be theatrical or is it a is it a two hour movie? Does it do we do we cut it and, and make it a series? How are how are you taking all of these new um, avenues, I guess, into your decision making for projects now? Well, I think even, you know, long before streaming, I was always looking at the material in kind of a platform agnostic way. You know, if you Mm -hmm. go all the way back to like the movies I made for HBO, you know, that if these walls could talk movies, those certainly were movies that we would not have been able to make for theatrical, you know, at the time, nobody would have believed in the box office power of those. So Mm -hmm. it made sense to make that material for that platform, you know, in that format. And I think, I think I've always looked at it from that approach, frankly, even in choosing when it was mostly theatrical, even in choosing a home for theatrical, you know, when we made Austin Powers, it made so much sense at New Line and, probably would have made much less sense at a more traditional studio, right, both right. in terms of what we were able to do creatively and just understanding that kind of project and the slightly out of the box marketing that it needed versus, you know, back then, you know, 1997, um, you know, what was happening with movie marketing at the time. So 
I feel like it's sort of the same now, even though it's different. So it's the same exercise. You're just uh, looking for different boxes, but I do look at every project and, you know, look at just what you said, you know, is it better as an hour? Is it better as a two hour? You know, would it be better as a limited series? I did have one executive say to me, we were talking about the adaptation of a book and we were discussing exactly this, you know, what shape it would be. And she works for a streaming platform. And she said to me, oh, um, you know, we're not going to focus on one-offs. We're not going to make those. And I said, oh, what's a one-off? Because I hadn't really heard that term in this context. And she said, oh, well, you know, a one-off, just like, you know, something that's 90 minutes long. And I said, oh, you mean a movie? Like a what movie, we call yeah, a movie. I was going to say what we call a movie. <laughs> you mean 90 minutes long with like three-act structure. And she said, yeah, we think of them as one-offs because we put too much time into marketing it and it's just a one-off. People can't revisit it. You know, we're trying to focus on things that people will binge, which I totally understand. I love a good Wait, binge. From a standpoint of like a series or from a standpoint of continuing the IP, would they do like a sequel if, if they knew it was going to be a sequel? What? Right. The point was that for the marketing dollars and muscle that they had available, that yeah. movies take what I call movies, what someone else uh -huh. might call a one-off. Um, that movies take up too much of their time and space for the amount of hours that people can consume it. That whether, because even if you're doing limited, we've seen this a lot of times, something comes on that's planned, planned as a limited, but then it has a huge success. So then all of a sudden it has a season two or three or seven or 10 or whatever that is. But I think now more than ever, this idea of, you know, I hear about it from executives, even when we're in development on the projects. You know, there used to be, and again, the network model is very different, but in streaming, this idea that you have a plot line that's pulling you through a series that's forcing you to binge and forcing you to binge, you know, the idea of something that really plays as an episodic, at mm -hmm. least not streaming, is completely gone. Nobody wants closed-ended episodes where you could just watch the third one and feel fine about it. Like, by the third one, you have to feel desperately invested in needing to watch the fourth one. It's very important. That is, no, that is interesting. And what, uh, what are you, what about the genres? Are you seeing difference? Are you feeling different? I mean, you've obviously had action and you've had drama, comedy, adult comedy, and now I want to talk about Naughty Nine in a few minutes, but how, how are, how are you looking at the different genres as you're making, as you're making decisions? And it's interesting what you said about, you know, New Line and Austin Powers, because they're, you know, when they're, when, before streaming and when there were just studios and, and, you know, you knew each studio's personality and, you know, especially if you were in the business, you're like, Oh, I could look at something and be like, that's a universal movie. That's a new line movie. That's a Warner's movie. Um, and it kind of spread out as, as things were going, but how are you looking at genres now as, as you choose what to be involved in? Well, I think the streamers are developing their own personalities. Obviously I think that, you could probably watch a trailer and guess if it was something that was on Apple TV versus something that was on Peacock, you know, and I think as they have more successes and success on a big level that they kind of refine their brand and their messaging. So I think, you you know, you can figure that out, out over time in terms of who would make what, you know, right now. And obviously, like coming off of, like you said at the beginning, both COVID and the strikes, and how that's affected workflow and the choice of what the executives think people want to watch. It's definitely, it's a time of flux, you know, where I think everyone is refiguring it out. I really worry about exhibition. I really worry about it. I know we had a great, you know, Barbenheimer summer, but all of those exhibitors, as we know, went through a reorganization, did everything they could to keep, to keep the lights on after COVID. And if we don't continue to supply them with product and product that, you know, will keep the doors open for them, there will be, you know, uh, even more shrinkage in that space, which is sad for me because I'm still at that place where I love to go to a movie theater. I mean, I probably go to the movies two or three times a week. You know, I yeah. like to go yeah. and sit in the theater. And frankly, even if it's something like this weekend, I went to a screening of lovely, lovely Celine Song movie, Past Lives. And I yes. talked to a friend afterwards and said, oh, you went to see that, you know, at a screening, like, but you could just stream it at home. But, you know, the photography was so beautiful and the performances were so exquisite. And as we all know, 
it's super fun to go to the movie theaters, to go to IMAX, to see, you know, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, or we all dressed in pink to go laugh together for Barbie. But even for, you know, this lovely, very small romantic movie that I went and saw on Sunday, it's a different experience because it's a shared experience when you see it in a movie theater. And that idea of seeing yourself in the characters, feeling like, you know, these people caring about the people on screen, it feels different when you're surrounded with other live people. So I really hope that we can get things back on track to protect exhibition because you should be able to go, you know, have a night out and see it in a movie theater. No, I couldn't agree more. We're big, big movies in theater. And obviously, you know, my history is theatrical with AMC and, and Arclight. And yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing like seeing a movie in a movie theater. And even, um, I'm not a big horror fan, but uh, the, you know, the, even my kids talking about Five Nights at Freddy's and they all went and they all, my youngest one went more than once, but I, you know, and they knew it was on Peacock. Obviously we have every streaming and everything we're in the business, but they, you know, seeing it in theaters. And I think that was, that proves your point, you know, financially is, is look how well that movie did when you could have, you know, they could have all watched it on Peacock, but you know, horror movies and, and comedies and every, you know, being in theaters and, and I loved past lives. It was so great. And, you know, and we're, we're getting into that season again right now. I mean, loving to see, you know, Priscilla and holdovers and radical and, you know, these movies that are, that are coming out. There's nothing, there's nothing like that uninterrupted, you know, and at Arclight, we at Arclight, we used to say, you know, we want to show movies the way the filmmakers intended. And, you know, and that's just I, I know people have beautiful at home theaters and they have, you know, sound systems and this and that. And it's it's it'll never be the same. It's not the same as going to theater. So no, I'm no, with you frankly, I think we're all guilty at home that it's very hard not to yes. pick up your phone. When right. you're at home, it dings. Or it's, it's get something else, dream, so I need to remind myself yeah. of something in my Amazon cart. It's very hard. Whereas in the movie theater, it's very simple because you put everything yep. away and you go on the magic carpet ride, which is right. Like, yeah, right. No, yeah, it I saw Priscilla in the movie theater also this week, and it was beautiful on screen. Really beautiful. Again, the photography, the performances, yeah, lovely. Yeah. So tell us about Naughty Nine and and your uh, your kind of step into all of these these holiday movies that you've been enjoying, and then this latest one. Well, it's so funny because whenever I'm talking about a new movie, I always feel that people want to say that I should focus on that genre because you know, as you mentioned a minute ago, there are a lot of genres on yeah. my resume. But I always say, you know, like I'm a film goer, I'm a film lover, I'm a woman. There are a lot of different things that are interesting to me. And right, so I feel right. like when I'm when I'm promoting something that was like a more serious drama, people say, Oh, well, you know, this is the feminist in you coming out and this is you know your point of view and you know what you have to say. And then I remember when I was promoting the movie Boiler Room, a really uh -huh. interesting movie that's kind of a morality tale about what's right, what's wrong, where is the line, how close can you get to the line? What happens if you inadvertently stepped over the line and what would you do about it? And I remember someone asking me, they said, oh, but it's such a male movie. Like the whole cast is all male and the feeling is so male. And I was like, but that's interesting to me also. You know, as a woman, it doesn't mean that I only want to watch rom-coms. You know, I love rom-coms. I've seen every movie, you know, in that space ever made. I worship, you know, Nora Ephron and Nancy Myers and all the rest of them in between. But um, I'm interested in lots of different genres one of which happens to be obviously holiday movies. So in our house, the holidays are a really big deal. My daughter and I especially love to bake and craft and make candy. <laughs> and we are big gingerbread makers at a very high, I wouldn't say professional level, but a very high level for people that just do it at home. And, you know, that idea of the holidays for us is really about family. It's precious time together. You know, as you know, you know, working moms, that that break period between Christmas and New Year's is oftentimes really the only time of the year that you can truly right. shut your phone off, put things away, you know, not worry about what, you know, problem is going to be on fire next. And so the holidays are just a very precious time to be with family. They're also a time for reflection. You know, the holidays are a time when you think about the year and what you did or 
what you'd like to do or what's coming ahead. And so for me, the holidays are just a rich time of emotion. And so I love holiday movies. I frankly also love the uh, Falderall and Fiddle Dee Dee. You know, I grew up you know, loving, loving, loving the original Grinch who stole Christmas so much. You know, those Rankin and Bass movies, you know, Rudolph and Frosty and all right, of that right. stop motion animation, classics forever. And then of course, John Favreau's brilliant elf, you know, that took on a little bit of the, uh, those stop motion characters in the, yeah. in the opening of that. So I've always loved Christmas movies. This one, Naughty Nine, takes a particularly fun look at it because, you know, we all joke about naughty and nice and, you know, there's hats people wear declaring themselves naughty or nice. The movie jumps off with the idea that there are these nine kids who are actually naughty. These are naughty kids. Those are the Naughty Nine. And the movie starts just after Christmas and the kids have all been stiff. They didn't get anything from Santa because they're naughty and he crosses you off the list when that happens. So the ringleader decides in kind of a, you know, George Clooney, Ocean's Eleven kind of way that he's gonna gather together kids that have the specific skills that he needs, a variety of different skills to steal their stuff from the North Pole because why wouldn't you if you could? So they go on this adventure and he ends up inadvertently kind of at the last minute taking his sister who he does not have a good relationship with and on the journey, their relationship evolves. And it's just such a sweet movie. It's a really heartwarming movie. To me, it's kind of a perfect Disney Christmas movie because it's really entertaining and really fun. And in the end, it will hopefully make you think a little bit about how you feel about yourself and your own naughty and niceness and your ability to have some control over those decisions in your life. That sounds fantastic. Was it a fun, uh, fun cast and crew to work on? So the kids are amazing. The director is fantastic. Alberto Belli, all that was so good. It was a hard movie because, you know, we built the North Pole outdoors. It was Montreal. Crazy oh, no. Montreal. And no. when you see, you know, the kids with the cold breath in their mouth, no cold breath was artificially created. <laughs> That's all really actual freezing space. And you know, anytime you work with child actors, you always have a limited production time yeah. in the day, which is appropriate and as it should be. But some of our actors, you know, our youngest actor was only eight. And so we had very, very limited shooting time. Yeah. And so it was such a fun movie. It was such a fun project. The logistics of it are very difficult when you're working with lots and lots of kids, because if you have a movie where you have lots of adult characters and one kid, then you normally plan around the schedule for the kid, but you have the adults to shoot the rest of the day. When it's all kids in lots of scenes, you're always trying to do these complicated things like block shooting and saying, okay, we'll shoot this side of the scene the first half of the day, and then the other side of the scene the second half of the day, which isn't normally how you would do it. But um, the, the costumes in this are also so much fun because the kids um, realize that they need to pretend to be elves to try and infiltrate the North Pole. And we had the uh, lovely, so talented, amazing Julia Caston, who I think I've done 10 movies with now, mm -hmm. but it might be nine or it might be 11, but it's a lot. And <laughs> Julia is so wildly talented. And when you see these elf costumes on the kids, they're so just elves reinvented and fantastical and in that space where we all feel like, well, of course you've seen every elf costume that could possibly be. You know, we see elf costumes at Halloween these are magical. I'm just, I'm so in love with them. It literally brings a smile to my face every time I see them. It's really, really fun. Oh, that's awesome. When you're putting your, mentioning Julia, do you, how, um, do you tend to work with your same, put your same crew together and have your, your same people now that, you know, you've, you've, you have so many projects, how do you mix it up or, or when you're, uh, when you're putting your crew together, what does your team look like? Well, I always like to work with people that I've worked with before. You know, when you've had a good experience, it makes it just easier. You have a shorthand with that person. It's like anybody mm -hmm. uh, in a different kind of job when you've worked with them before, it makes it easier. But it's really, it's very particular to the project because, you know, sometimes you're limited by location. You know, sometimes, you know, if you're shooting in Montreal, it's uh, much more cost efficient to hire a local Canadian person than to bring someone in, you know, so there's those kinds of um, uh, you know, uh, restrictions to it, but 
I always do like working with the same people over and over again. You know, the guys I did the Bad Moms movies with, I, I now have both a fourth and fifth movie in development with them. We've done three together already. And we do tend to hire almost the same crew in terms of department oh, yeah. heads over and over again, because those movies are like a certain tone of comedy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as much as people are available, not everybody's always available for every project like that, but it is nice to kind of keep the, uh, the family together. That seems almost like a little reunion each time. Well, yeah. And again, you're just, you're not starting from scratch, you know, right, which is sometimes right. exciting to start with someone new, but there's also just a getting to know you period. So we you have, so Naughty Nine's coming out on November 22nd. That's coming next. You just mentioned you have Bad Moms 4 and 5. In oh, sorry, these are Bad Moms movies. It's just with those guys. Oh, oh, with the same guys. Okay, yeah, I was getting yeah. really excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are doing um, Bad Moms as a TV show. So oh, we're okay. We're looking at on streaming soon enough. Um, oh, my gosh. very fun. And we're also... We've been developing for a while now a Bad Moms stage musical, which is very Oh my gosh. Okay, our producer Emma will go nuts. She's a, the biggest Bad Moms fan there. She's going to love that. So there's more in the Bad Moms space coming. The two movies that I'm doing with them, one is another comedy in that space, but it's not a Bad Moms movie. And the other okay. one is an animated movie for Sony. I'm doing my oh, first ever full um, animated movie, which is really so much fun. Oh my gosh, how's that? That's interesting. It's great. You know, we started it at the beginning of COVID when that was, you know, pretty much all you could do in the yeah. moment. Yeah. And it's really, really fun. You know, I had done so much animation in certain movies, you know, the Alice movies. We had a lot mm -hmm. of wholly yeah. animated characters. We had some hybrid characters, you know, it was partial animation and part live action. So I had worked a lot in that space, but it's very different starting from scratch. And we're so excited to be working with Sony on that because this is a movie where it will need to look like something you've never seen before based on the idea. And Sony has had such success in that space, you know, with their Spider-Verse movies. Right, really, right. Like looking at something that had been done for a long time in a certain way and figuring out how to reinvent the wheel and make something that looks different and really exciting. So we're doing that in a different way on our movie. Yeah, no, they they have really broken new ground with that. I mean, people that I don't think would ever or haven't seen animated in years are in love with the Spider-Verse look and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles look and just that, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of new things happening there. That's very cool. Well, Suzanne, you are so busy. It sounds like you have projects lined up and so, so busy. Tell me, is there anything when you do get a few minutes and you're not, in comp competitive gingerbread because in my head you guys are competitive gingerbread builders and bakers what um is there anything that you're watching or streaming or or reading that you're really loving you know let's think what am i watching that's really good well i'm dying to watch the crown because i love the crown that is coming soon I weirdly got pulled in and I have not watched The Bachelor before, but I have a group watching The Golden Bachelor. Like, I guess everyone on the planet is watching The Golden Bachelor. Right. It's sort of an interesting, um, yeah, social experiment. But this time of year, as you mentioned, as the awards movies are starting to, you know, become available and um, it's always my favorite time of year because yeah. I, I mean, I watch a lot of movies all the time, but I watch so many. I really try and watch everything that's in the mix before I vote, you know, for the Oscars, for the yeah. Academy Awards. So I, I always love this time of year. I'm really looking forward to The Colored Purple also. I just saw the trailer for that. Yeah, it that looks amazing. Amazing, so good. Um, yeah, there's too much to watch now though. You know, that's the thing is you see people and they're like, oh, I, I binge this and I binge that. And I've been, I don't know where people find the time because there's so many of well, those shows I've never seen any of them, it, usually because I'm in production, you know, but there, there are some big ones that I have missed. I have on my list someday, I'm going to watch The Sopranos, which I've never seen one of. I'm going right. to watch Breaking Bad. I'm going to watch The Wire, but um, yeah, someday. When I the Wire is, uh, I've never watched The Wire and that's on my list too. I just started, or I have tried to keep up with um, Lessons in Chemistry uh, because I love the book so much and that's, that's, I think it's on its fourth or fifth episode now. And I've been trying to kind of keep up with that one in real time. It's a good one. Yeah. It's a good one, but I'm like you, I'm more of a movie and movie theaters person. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I tend to also like a, uh, a kind of like a romantic period drama. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm in that space for sure. I mean, yeah. frankly, during COVID, I feel like my daughter and I just went back and watched any version of Pride and Prejudice that we could find. We <laughs> well, there's them. a lot of them. Just when you think you've watched all of them, you're like, oh, wait, there's another one. You know, Pride um, and Prejudice and Emma. There's many, many, many versions. You can never go wrong with those ever. Right. Yeah. So good. Right. Well, Suzanne, thank you so, so much for joining today. And it's so good to see you. And I just, yeah, everything that you're doing and being so busy. And we're so excited to watch The Naughty Nine next week on Disney and see, um, I'm going to be watching the costumes in detail now. You've got me, uh, you've got my intrigue, my intrigue up on those costumes. It sounds beautiful. Oh yeah. You're going to, you're going to love those elf costumes. And then, um, yeah, next up I'm doing a movie, The Other End of the Spectrum, like we talked about in that um, serious drama. I am so lucky and proud that I'm working with Roxane Gay and she wow. adapted her memoir, Hunger, and we're gonna be oh uh, filming that for Lifetime, the okay. first part of 2024. And that has been a project I have been working on for years and years and years. One of those ones I've like, you know, pushed and dragged to the screen. So I'm super excited and then Next summer, June of 2024, we'll have the next one on Disney Plus, which is Descendants 4, The Rise oh, of Red, which is an yeah. original musical, which was so much fun. All singing, all dancing, all Disney. My Emma favorite thing. Yeah, love that series. Christmas. There's nothing better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have we have The Naughty Nine, and then we'll have, so wait, Hunger's not going to come before when. Oh no, will, we're going to oh, shoot yeah. in January, we'll February, of 2024, okay. and then we'll December four, December four, and then come out June of 2024, okay. and then Hunger. That's exciting. Yeah. That has been, um, yeah, that is a that's a very very popular book. So that one will be on Lifetime. You said, yeah, it'll be on Lifetime. I've never worked on okay. Lifetime before, but again, like you were talking about with, um, you know, the different platforms, that was uh, the one where it seemed like it was the right fit for the uh, material. So. Yeah, and I think just the the bar is so high everywhere. I mean, there is great content everywhere. You don't have to, you know, say it's only this or it's only this. I think there's, you know, there's just, there's really great content in so many places. That's exciting. Yeah, so exciting. It's so great to see you. It and was so good to see you. Continuing to, you know, promote women's voices in the mix. It's really important. You know, I, I love Thank this you. moment in time where we have more women in the jobs that are making the decisions. So these stories get pushed forward. It's really absolutely. Amazing. No, it's thank you. To watch them. Yes, exactly. And thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Of course. Great to see you. All Thanks right. so much. Okay. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womeninentertainment.com. Be sure to watch The Naughty Nine. It premieres Wednesday, November 22nd on the Disney Channel and then is available for streaming on Disney Plus Thanksgiving Day, November 23rd. It's great for the whole family.